And so uh, Joan will follow up on the point that, uh, that Stephen Weinberg started. Um, she's professor in the Department of Biological Sciences in Stanford. And her current book is um, the, the Darwin book, Evolution and Christian Faith. But the one before that, which I highly recommend, is called Evolution's Rainbow, Diversity, Gender, and Sexuality, which is a complete eye-opener. So Joan Roughgarden. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak. Um, and in, in the spirit of a... Uh, pre preparing a conversation, what I'd like to do is uh, react and uh, extend some of the points uh, that were raised earlier. Um, first of all, uh, with respect to where I'm coming from, uh, as was just mentioned, uh, my previous book, the one before the most recent one, was called Evolution's Rainbow and about uh, gender and sexuality and uh, nature and also in people. And uh, one of the principal conclusions of that is that one of the branches of Darwin's writings, the branch that pertains to sex roles called sexual selection theory, I think uh, have concluded is entirely incorrect and on the wrong track. And so it provides us with, apart from the truth of that or not, um, it provides us with an interesting test case of the uh, willingness of the scientific community to see someone challenged, uh, whom we hold at least in the status of a hero and possibly in the status of a prophet. Now, um, the most recent book that I've done called Evolution and Christian Faith um, is quite a bit different. It's a very small book. And um, it's motivated specifically by uh, the need to have some material for uh, the people um, whom I envision and know personally uh, as people of faith and who uh, are wondering what evolution is actually about. So in a sense, what I'm going to be doing is uh, putting some, some different perspectives on the table. If you consider what went before as the opening of a chess game in which a lot of pawns were put out on the table and some knights, then what I'm going to begin is to put some pawns on the table together with some bishops. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but unlike a real chess game, both sides can actually talk to one another. So it need not end uh, in a victory or a draw, but it actually could end uh, in a bargained solution. Now, um, the, uh, and I should say also by way of where I'm coming from, uh, my parents were missionaries and, and I grew up in Indonesia in the Philippines uh, in the Episcopal church tradition. And I uh, left uh, the church. I didn't quit the church or anything. I just sort of drifted away for many, many years until about 10 years ago when I had some very serious personal issues I was dealing with and returned to church at that time. So it's in the, over the last 10 years that I've been part of a, a, a religious community and so therefore have a sense of uh, what the questions are that people are asking. And what was needed was a succinct statement of what evolution was. Uh, and also a friendly statement of what evolution was. And um, so um, I employed a very strong fact theory distinction and simply stipulated that uh, the main facts of evolution are two, namely that all of life uh, belongs to a common family tree, and secondly, that biological species change through time in contradistinction to uh, physical species. And um, I just simply stipulate those. And, and that also leads me to say that the book that I've just written is not a, a secular book. And, uh, and it's not a book about general science. It's actually a religious book. And it's being shelved in the religious sections of bookstores. And um, then the theory of evolution, as I was to say, drawing a strong fact theory distinction here. Theory of evolution is um, what explains the facts. And as you all know, the elements of uh, basic Darwinian theory as we understand it today are that there is variation generated by uh, random mutation, and then there is the process of natural selection, or which I sort of rename in the book, natural breeding, that operates on the variation and produces changes in the, 
in the stock or the population. Now one of the interesting things uh, when I was doing the research for this was to be able to tell the narr this basic Darwinian narrative in terms drawn directly from the Bible because this metaphor of random variation and a randomness in the generation of variation and of a change in the stock through breeding uh, must go back to the dawn of agriculture. And so therefore these very concepts are found within the Bible. And uh, in particular in Genesis there's an extended treatment uh, by, uh, ab about the farmer Jacob who was a, a man of God and his interaction with his master Laban. To make a long story short, uh, Laban had been beating up on Jacob over the years and uh, um, uh, God said to uh, Jacob, um, well first of all, so Jacob and Laban uh, struck a deal that Laban could keep, or that Jacob could keep the, par the uh, cattle and uh, sheep and so forth that were speckled in brown and the other cattle and sheep would revert to Laban's ownership. And um, God uh, spoke to uh, Laban, uh, to Jacob, and, um, and said that uh, I will uh, recompense you for the injustices you've found. And so according to Genesis, God caused the uh, rams, or the, the males, of the uh, speckled and brown cattle and sheep to, quote, leap upon, unquote, the females and do most of the breeding. And as a result, the stock gradually changed through time to uh, come to be uh, consist of the type of individuals that lo that Jacob owned. So in this way, uh, the hand of God directly uh, drove, if you will, uh, the course of evolution in this species. Now, uh, and you could just lift this passage and plug it directly into an evolution book if you wanted. Now, the issue of randomness is also a real uh, red flag in a lot of these circles. And there's a parable that many, many of you may know about the mustard seed. And this is from the New Testament. And it has to do with uh, Jesus discussing his concept of, uh, uh, of, of teaching, his notion of teaching. And uh, he draws an analogy to a farmer who's going along and as seeds drop off the end of the cart, the seeds land on shallow soil and on good soil and so forth. And um, those that land on shallow soil don't grow. Those that land on good soil grow and produce fruit a hundred times uh, over in a hundredfold. And similarly, um, he describes his own teaching as though they were mustard seeds, that the teachings go out to the multitude and those who are capable of hearing, hear them. Those who don't hear, don't, don't listen, don't hear. But those who do hear then go forth and bear fruit. Uh, and this is basically the notion of randomness, that is throwing the ideas out to the multitude and just seeing where, um, the, where they hear where the messages are heard. <clears throat> so I even used the phrase in the book that a mutation is a mustard seed of DNA tossed into bodies at random and then you see in what bodies uh, those mustard seeds of DNA prosper and in those bodies then fruit is produced a hundredfold. And uh, so in this way one can directly find uh, passages within the Bible that um, can lead to an inherently friendly narrative about what evolution is. And um, that was uh, a very sort of exciting thing to do because you can then uh, actually c begin a discourse without the uh, supposition that, uh, that you're automatically uh, going to start a fight. Now, um, the rest of the book goes into uh, you know, it has a chapter on intelligent design and, and above all my, my uh, r religious, if you will, or theological criticisms of intelligent design. It goes into uh, a lot of other issues. It's a, um, but um, rather, than, 
what, what I'd like to, to, to do now is, is to mention some issues that specifically came up this morning. And, um, and I guess what it comes, what my sense was is that uh, the discussion this morning was dealing with caricatures of both scientists and of uh, people of faith. And um, I think that um, I think one issue involves um, the claim that scientists have heroes and not prophets. And I don't think that's obvious in the least. And I think that um, uh, the status of Darwin in evolutionary biology at the moment is that of a prophet and not of a hero. And I think that anyone who seriously uh, uh, finds uh, fault with an element of uh, Darwin's writings that's not some sort of trivial fact um, is inviting suicide that only tenure can protect you from. <laughs> um, so I just simply doubt the truth of the claim that scientists have uh, heroes and not prophets. Um, secondly, there's an issue of um, whether science is correct. You see, if we're going to, to work with people who at the moment are anti-evolution or anti-science, and if you see these people saying, well, I believe the Bible, I don't believe scientists, um, are they idiots? As is in effect implied by the previous discussion. Now, on the other hand, um, is the science correct? I mean, what do we have to go by? Not a little while ago, estrogen was being recommended for uh, breast cancer. Now it's a no-no. Um, and point after point, you just never really know, if you're in the general public, what scientific assertion is correct. That's a big problem. Now you can say, okay, it'd be great if everybody were scientifically literate, but they have to be more than scientifically literate. They actually have to make a decision as to what elements of science at any one time are, are, are correct and some are frequently not tested. Now, from that perspective, if you don't really know uh, whether the scientists, whether the science is right or not, then um, the credibility of the Bible rises in um, comparison, because the Bible has, after all, been around for a couple thousand years. And so, um, it's not as clear cut as this morning's discussion uh, seemed to suggest that obviously you should side with science and, and uh, not with the Bible. Because if you don't know if the science is true, then what do you do? So it's not irrational for someone to um, relatively emphasize uh, the, the uh, status of the Bible. <clears throat> 